Beyond Economics and Back. Tinklalai de Renge, Lietuvos laisvosios rinkos institutas. Welcome to the Lithuanian Free Market Institute podcast. Uh, my name is Ognas Petronis and my guest today is Eamon Butler. Eamon Butler is an economist. Uh, he's a director of the Adam Smith Institute, rated one of the world's leading policy think tanks. He has degrees in economics, philosophy and psychology and gained a PhD in from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, he's also author of books on economists such as Milton Friedman, Friedrich Augustus Hayek, Ludwig von Mises and Adam Smith. He contributes to leading UK print and broadcast media on subjects ranging from health pol policy, economic management, taxation, uh, public spending, transport, pensions and welfare. And some of his popular publications, including the best book on the market, The Rotten State of Britain, and the alternative manifesto have attracted some uh, serious attention. And today we're going to discuss uh, the universal basic income. Mr. Butler, thank you very much for your time. And thank you for being here. You're podcast. welcome. It's very good to be with you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I'm just going to begin um, by overlook, looking over the, the, the situation uh, regarding the debate on the UBI. So my view is that in the last decade or so, uh, all this media hype around the universal basic income, which is an idea that everyone should uh, get some basic income from the government, regardless whether they work or not, um, or regardless of any qualifications. So this all this hype around this idea, it's it, it has reached its uh, peak several times. Uh, the first one was, I think, during the pandemic, with all this hype that we're going to rebuild a better world after the pandemic is over. And then after the chat GPT, artificial, artificial intelligence tool was released, it was all the, the we were still having this hype that robots and artificial intelligence, they're all going to take home, take our jobs. And we, we are not going to work anymore. Elon Musk, uh, the famous entrepreneur, has recently commented that in the future, probably none of us will have a job. And there is going to be not even a universal basic income, but universal high income. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Uh, do you think it's it's is, it, the UBI is there to save us? Or <laughs> is, it, uh, is it more of a, let's say, existential threat? Or, um, um I don't think it's a good idea. In fact, I think it's an extremely bad idea. I mean, it's partly motivated out of uh, ideology. Um, but, you know, if you do, do try and take it seriously, well, it has some merits. At the moment, we have in most developed countries very complicated um, welfare systems uh, that leave some people uncovered and then uh, give other people you know, a double dose of benefits and, and so on. Um, and we have cash benefits and we have benefits in kind. In other words, uh, things like free housing or, or uh, uh, free education and free health care and all of that sort of thing. So it's a very complicated picture. And there is some attraction to the idea that instead of all of that stuff, uh, the government should simply um, take what money it's got and give um, a, a standard income that uh, would keep people out of poverty to everybody. Uh, rich and poor, whether they're working or not, uh, everybody would get the, the same uh, standard income. So that by, that by doing that, you have eliminated poverty uh, and you've made the system very much more uh, simple. And you've also given people a bit of autonomy instead of, instead of them being told, well, I, you must live in this house, you must go to that school, uh, you must uh, have have this uh, range of goods um, and uh, and all of those things. You're instead you're giving them the money and then they can enter the market and buy these things for themselves. So. Uh, not only is this a popular idea on the the left, who you know who want to see more more government action, but at the same time, uh, a number of libertarians have uh, said, "Well, this is this is not such a bad idea. Perhaps we we should be realistic and, and not worry too much about it." But I I can tell you 101 reasons why it's a really bad idea. 
Uh, please do, please do. <laughs> oh well, I mean, the I mean the the standard economic uh, um, approach on this is that well the cost of doing that is absolutely huge. That if you are giving every person in the country uh, enough to live on, enough to keep them out of poverty, um, then that's going to cost an awful lot of money, and somebody has got to pay that money. And the answer is that it's people who are are working. Um, and you know, I suppose wealthier people, if you have a wealth tax, um, these sorts of people would be paying. So you have a very high uh, social benefit, uh, but much higher taxes in order to pay for it. So part of the argument is that, well, that there would be um, a disincentive effect. People would say, well, if, if you're going to pay me money um, enough to live on, then why should I bother going out to work? So if you don't work, you get paid money. And if you do work, you pay absolutely astronomical taxes. <laughs> well, uh, this is a sort of disincentive effect um, on, on steroids. This is, it's, uh, uh, why should anybody work at all? And I think the argument is, is that, well, you know, people like working and they do work and uh, all of that kind of thing. But I think Mm, we saw it with lockdown when we paid uh, in the UK and uh, various other countries. We paid people not to work, basically. We paid them to stay at home. And they did that with great pleasure and delight. In fact, many of them have still stayed at home and not come back into the workforce. So I think you've got a real economic problem um, in terms of the tax burden that's needed and the incentive uh, uh, effect on, on work. So those are just the, the economic uh, problems. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> reacting a little bit to what you you have just said is, I think that um, it is sometimes the, the UBI is sometimes portrayed as an issue that, so to say, cuts across political divisions. So that you know you can find people on the left who support the UBI, the libertarians support the UBI, but it seems that in fact people support very very different ideas of how it should work. Like you have this sort of post work movement where they want to, well, not really get rid of capitalism because old school Marxists are also very critical of UBI because, you know, people are people are nevertheless going to spend their money in the market, right? And market is evil. But, but yes, yeah, this post-work movement, which wants to have UBI and to have all the free benefits and a huge welfare system, and one want people to work as as little as possible, and then you have the libertarians who have who also sort of support the UBI, but who have completely different idea of what it's all about, right? Um, um, and yeah, yes, I think that, and I think I think that is one of the the problems of any system like this that, um, and any time you're talking about social justice or social programs. People have got their own different ideas as to to what they they mean. I mean, Hayek uh, famously pointed this out in uh, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Um, and and when you uh, when you look, they've all got, actually got different ideas. So how are you going to make it work? Because there's going to be a fight even over the design of the thing. Never mind um, how it actually works and operates. Um, so everybody's got different ideas and everybody thinks uh, their ideas uh, is absolutely wonderful. And I think many of them actually haven't thought through many of the the implications. I mean, you know, for example, there are lots of uh, this is a, you know, a political idea. You, it's, it's political policy. You, you have to get the politics right. And I think that uh, there are many political problems with it because, you um, uh, what about special cases? Right, there are, are bound to be people who say, "Well, you know that uh, universal basic income is fine for most people, but I'm in a special position because I don't know I'm I'm particularly disabled or I need caring for and uh, various other things like that." It could be a hundred and one different dif different things. You know, I live in a, a remote area and there's no local facilities and so on. So there will always be special cases. And at the moment, we have complicated welfare systems that do try to do something about special cases. That's part of the thing that makes them very complicated, which is what liberals and libertarians don't like very much. Um, but at the same time, it does actually 
if you like, get the job done because it makes sure that um, nobody is left behind just because they, they have some uh, peculiarity which, which uh, uh, disadvantages them. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen is that you're going to get campaigns for people coming forward and saying, well, we need special exemptions for this and special treatment for that. Um, and so you're going to end up with um, a, a system which is just as complicated as the welfare system that you're trying to, to dispose of. The only trouble is that because it goes not just to the people who need it, uh, but even to people who don't need the support, uh, then it's, it becomes incredibly expensive and cumbersome to, to, uh, to fund. Right. Um, and then there is another problem, which is what do you mean by basic right? Like what what is basic? Like people may have very very different understandings. Of what includes basic needs? Oh, uh, and I you, you know yeah, and I've seen this over and over and over again. I, I you know I've spent what forty five years in and around the political system, and I can see exactly what is what is going to going to happen. That there's going to be all sorts of. Um, demands for for special treatment and and so on and so on and, and everybody will have a different idea as to as to how it should be done so um you know you you can see that politically this is going to be an extremely difficult uh, thing to 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 put into place right um okay uh going to the let's say pro ubi arguments and trying to take them as, as seriously as possible oh, yeah. so there is this the argument from the UBI side that UBI may actually encourage people to um, set set their own business, so that people would not know, know that they're securing away the, their basic security needs are going to be met, even if their business fails. So they will just take the risks that they otherwise wouldn't take and maybe it would even even create a better cultural environment for for people who want to who want to create their own business but they they, they do not have the courage at the moment um do you find that persuasive at all or, or, or um, no? I, I can see I can see where it's coming from but I think that there are um uh, problems of reality about it, uh, which is that um, I can see where it's coming from, that if people feel secure, then they're more likely to take on the risk of, of um, uh, starting up a business. And starting a business is a big risk. I mean, if you don't have any money, you've got to probably borrow money either from the bank or you borrow it from your friends and your family. Um, and it's very embarrassing if you don't make money and you can't repay, repay your friends and, and family and it's a real problem if you can't repay the bank either so so uh this is a big disincentive against people um starting a new business but at the same time i mean one one of my uh, books that you didn't mention is on entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. i looked in some detail at uh, why people start businesses or don't start businesses and the biggest thing is uh taxation that people starting a business, and I know this from my, my own case, when I started a business, and I think probably for the first three months, we were talking about, well, how to minimize the tax burden that, that there would be on the business, rather than what we were going to do, because it made such a huge uh, difference. And people look at uh, tax and they say, uh, well, uh, we've got company taxes at whatever it is, 25%, let's say. Um, so I've got to make enough money, not only uh, to to live on and support my family, but I've got to make enough to pay those taxes. So you're increasing the risk even further. You're taking a risk by borrowing all this money and setting up a business and buying stock in and all the rest of it, um, advertising, you, you know, you name it. And uh, uh, And here you are, you're putting up you will be putting up taxes un under this new arrangement. A lot of it will fall on business, of course, because that's politically where it's easiest to, to, to do. And that will be a very big disincentive against people starting new business, even if they know that, well, they're not going to be destitute uh, if, the, if the business doesn't work. I mean, today they know that they're not going to be destitute if the business doesn't work. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, if they have to pay those higher taxes, that, that is a, a real killer. Taxes and regulations, but particularly taxes, is a killer on new, new business formation. So I'm not actually convinced by that argument. I mean, I think people still have a fair measure of, of security. Mm -hmm. You're right. Um, yes. Well, you're obviously a skeptic on the UBI. Do you think that the problem with the universal basic income is that it can be done? Or is the problem that it cannot be done? Um, I think it would be a complete mess. Uh, this is uh, true of, of most systems which uh, we try to impose on people and, and impose on the economic system. And um, uh, Friedrich Hayek, who you, you mentioned, uh, was uh, very clear on this subject. He, he said that policy needs to, uh, to evolve, if you like. You find out what works and then you do more of it. You don't just tear up what you've got and then impose something that's completely new because the chances are you'll get it wrong and you'll probably get it wrong in a big way. And the bigger the program is, the more you're going to get it wrong. Uh, and it, 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 if you've got lots of different people doing lots of different things and one or two of them fail, well, OK, you can deal with that. If you've got one big system covering everybody and it doesn't work, well, that is a national disaster. <laughs> so I think that that is is the snag of, of this. I, I think that. Uh, the possibility of it just not working at all it is is it's clear and 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 and, and possible uh, and therefore uh, it, it's a really big problem if if it doesn't work and and that is rather frightening I think so that that's the problem right I I mean there are all it's not just uh, disincentives on everybody. I mean I think there there would be under the system particular disincentives on young people. Uh, if you're taking if you're giving everybody the same amount of money, then uh, to a young person, uh, maybe just leaving school or university, uh, that is a, a fabulous amount of money. Uh, you know it's probably not an amount of money which they they're used to. Um, older people who are in work and particularly, you know, if they've built up uh, uh, a reputation and they've, they've got a good uh, job or, or they started a business, um, you know, uh, enough money to live on is not really the, their problem. They, they, you know, they don't, they, they don't suffer much. Um, but uh, so they would probably, older people would probably carry on working. But I, I wonder whether younger people would carry on working. I'm not, I'm not sure that they would. And so I think you've got also then a cultural problem, which will go on through the, the generations of, of uh, young people who decide that they can live on what the government's giving them and they don't have to work. Um, so eventually they get older and they're still not working and older and they're still not working. So you have that going up through the generations. And I think you might get quite a tension between uh, the people who are working and paying taxes and the young people in particular who are not working um, and getting getting most of the benefits. Right, but what you just described, is it not very much like the situation that we are in currently in the West? Like the people are, getting significant benefits from their governments, right? And they have been getting significant benefits from the government for generations. And, uh, well, the, let's say the, 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 the average age at which people start having a real job, let's say, well, what's a real job, but start having a stable job and, and, uh, uh get uh, finally finish the phase of uh, university studies volunteering going around the world helping uh, some volunteering program programs in in uh, in Africa or in in, in, in the Pacific or, or somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, then they, they really start doing starting to settle and doing something it, it gets later and later and later and there is there is distinction between people who, make um, make uh, the, the money and and pay very high taxes and then those who are living on the benefits um well you know i i do agree and uh you know one of the reasons i i think that is because government has uh, 
um, ha has grown uh, too large, and uh, uh, I, I think I think that is a problem. Um, and its budgets have uh, expanded too much, and it's been able to impose taxes without very much um, opposition. But yes, you're right. There, there is that tension, of course. In a um, an increasingly wealthy society, you would expect that sort of thing to happen. Um, and I, I don't have a problem with that. And, uh, you know, Elon Musk says uh, none of us will have a job in uh, 50 years time. That's fine by me, you know, if we can all actually uh, live comfortably without having to slog and, and do hard work. I, th I think that's really great if we can get robots to do it for us and machines to do it for us, which, of course, we do. You know, people don't dig trenches by hand anymore, then you send in a machine to, to do it. It's much more efficient and, and much nicer. And you and then, okay, you, you need fewer people to dig ditches, but at the same time, they can be out doing something which is more rewarding, both for themselves and, and for society. So, um, I, you know, I, I do think that, that things move on, and as we get richer, um, as a society, then yes, of course, the people... Um, people will tend to be out of work for longer because they don't have to work for longer and you know they'll retire earlier and start work later so yes i can i can see that that's happening and i can see that yes there is indeed a a, a tension but i don't think ubi resolves that tension uh really it's it, if anything it probably increases it because of the, the sheer cost of the program um, and it would make the government budget even larger. And I, you know, I don't trust governments with the budgets they've got. I'm not sure that I want them even larger. Right. Well, in in your opinion, because well, okay. So this is a big question, going a bit further from the UBI. Um, but well, I think you've written on this. Um, what do you think is the situation regarding economic freedom? in um, the Western world today? And, and do you think it, it's getting better or it's likely to get worse in the future? Um, I think that we, we are surprisingly free in one sense, which is that most of us can do more or less what we like. Um, and that was not always the case. You know, I, I see the point that if you're living in poverty, um, you know, do you call that freedom? Well, it's it's not a very nice kind of freedom. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I want people to become uh, as rich as possible. I'm concerned about the expansion of government because I think that it probably slows down that progress. It, it, I think that it uh, uh, reduces uh, incentives uh, to, to work and uh, to create uh, and to innovate. And therefore, it slows down uh, human progress and, and it, it slows down the growth of the, the economy. Um, so I think uh, government expansion is, is bad for, for that point of view. But, uh, um, uh, you know, so that's an, another reason why I'm, I'm very sceptical uh, about, about this idea. So um, I, don't know. I, I, I don't think that it would be any any better than the, the welfare system that, that we've got in terms of restoring incentives like that. Um, it seems to me that the big issue regarding the UBI is the automation issue, right? Is the idea that, well, if, if the robots and uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence take, take all of our jobs and there is barely any need for us to work, um, then something like the UBI probably would be in a way inevitable, right? Um, the arguments against this would be something that in the past, technological innovation took away some jobs, but it also created some other jobs that people would not imagine would exist, like yoga instructors or... I don't know, programmers or whatever. And so making a careful guess, let's say, uh, what would be your careful guess on, on the future of development of, of technology and how it affects the, 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 the labor market? Um, yes, I think it's probably just the same as uh, every previous uh, revolution. You know, you can think of 
Well, I mean, you can go right back to um, industrialization and, uh, you know, people um, broke mach industrial machinery because they said it's doing us out of our jobs. And then you could go as far forward as to say, well, what about the, the telegraph? Uh, that did people out of jobs as, as messengers and, and uh, in the post office and so on. And uh, what about electricity? That did a lot of uh, people who uh, manually uh, uh, operated machinery um, out, out of uh, out of uh, work as well, or uh, the the dot com revolution. I mean, that's it, that completely changed our, our lives as well. The internal combustion engine. Um, all of these things have uh, made a difference to the way the economy has worked. Karl Marx was absolutely right when he said that the uh, uh, the means of production will change the, uh, the, uh, the, the the shape of society. So uh, absolutely right. The social relations are governed by the the industrial relations, the the, the, the uh, means of production. So um, yes, it will make changes. And if I knew which changes it would make, I would be a billionaire, right? Because I would invest in all the right things. And I don't know that. And nobody knows exactly what the impact of it is going to be. And it seems to me that if it spares, if uh, artificial intelligence coupled with all of the other things that have gone before, um, have uh, are going to uh, make it easier for us and we don't have to work so hard then uh, i think that this is a very good thing for society so we talked about uh, libertarians supporting the the ubi in the beginning and going back a little bit um milton friedman the famous author he argued that the the, the specific welfare programs could be replaced by a negative income tax, which works a little bit differently, um, not exactly the same as the UBI. Um, so the idea of the negative income tax is that up to a certain level, if you don't make the the, the amount of of the money that is set at a certain level, that the government gives you the compensation so that you reach a certain amount of. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so Milton Friedman argued for the 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 uh, for, for this kind of negative income tax. You've been writing about Milton Friedman um, yeah. positively, as I believe. Do you think he was wrong with this? Well, he was a lovely man, but he wasn't completely right on this. But he was, I think, pro probably mostly right on it. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, his idea is that you set a line. And then if you don't earn enough, uh, if you if you earn something below that line, then you will get uh, cash, basically. And if you uh, earn above that line, then you will start paying taxes. And you will need, uh, if you like, a sort of sliding scale at the, the margin in order to make sure that there's always an incentive for people to um, get a better job if they can, uh, so they're earning a little bit more money. Um, and that sort of gets them off the, the, the benefit. So in Friedman's system, uh, it was an incentive system to make sure that nobody fell below a certain line, but at the same time to build in incentives so that you were always better off, even if you were getting a little bit of state money as well, you were always better off by getting a better job. And that is really quite different from the, uh, the, the black and white, all or nothing, um ubi idea where you know, every, everybody gets uh gets that and there's there's really then no incentive or little incentive um to to get a better better job friedman's ideas um really have been introduced in in in, in minor ways in uh, a lot of countries in the form of earned income tax credits and, and this is what it is so you've got to be earning in order to, to get you know the 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 incentive the the the, the extra money uh yes you you you'll get a basic but at the same time there's that incentive on it as well i think uh, again i mean i think friedman's idea is going to be would be politically difficult and we've seen that in the uk where we've tried to replace 
54 different social benefits by basically two. And we haven't, well, we made some progress, but we haven't made all of that much progress because as I say, there are always special cases. So you've got to have it, uh, special um, uh, add-ons and bolt-ons uh, here, here and there. Um, and I think Friedman's idea has exactly the same problem. It, it'll still end up being scrambled by the, the political process. And of course, you, you've got the problem as well, both in UBI and in the negative income tax system and, and in the earned income tax credit system, that um, people will always be trying to bid up the so-called basic rate. Because if everybody gets it, everybody has an incentive to make sure that it's as high as possible. And if there's only a few people who are actually paying it because, you know, the minority people are in work, uh, then, it, you know, it's it's like um, two wolves and a, a lamb deciding what to have for dinner. It's, you know, there's going to be no question about it. It's just going to go up. And then the, the incentives on people to to actually earn more money will will just uh, fall to zero because the government will be taking most most of their income. So um, I, I I think again it, you know it 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 has problems. It's better. It's a lot better. Friedman's idea than what we've got. It is simpler, and uh, if you could make it work, um, I I think it would have a very positive uh, incentive effects, and that's exactly what you need. And it would also keep people out of poverty. So, so you know, why invent something new that I'm not sure is going to work when you've got that idea around, which has sort of worked in some countries, and then you can let's you know let's tweak those experiments and and get on and and you know see if we can improve it. Right. Well, um, it, to harshly put that, to slightly disagree, let's say, with what you've said, I went through uh, the negative income experiments that they made in the US in the 70s and 80s. So it's very interesting. So they made some experiments to check, like, what do you do now with the, the, the UBI experiments that are going all around the world? So in the US in the 70s and 80s, they, they made some very carefully designed studies. And I think Leslie Ford is a contemporary author who, who, who has written about these. Um, and I really recommend our listeners to, to, to take a look into that. So the point, my point is that these... Um, these studies measured the long-term effect that two years of being on negative income tax had on people's income. And it turned out that it, it really had the effect on the incentives, let's say. So incentives to learn new skills, incentives to stay in the labor market. And it had the, the negative effect was so high that in the long term, people without the uh, without the negative income tax made more money than those on the negative income tax. So that, I found this very very interesting. But my what worries me is that I see a lot of um, universal basic income uh, experiments in the U.S. right now. They're popping up all the time. I think it's because uh, the uh, local governments got the, the money for the COVID uh, relief uh, uh, programs or something like this. I don't remember the exact English name for it. but uh, And so they're using it to fund the UBI experiments. But those experiments are very, very poorly designed. And it, it's a huge problem. They're purposely, they seem to be purposely designed to get as positive results as possible. Like, for example, they don't measure the long-term effects on the income. They don't measure whether, for example, they just measure whether people are employed or unemployed, but they don't measure whether it's full-time employment or not, or it's part-time, like things like that. So it, it just seems to be to be made in a way to get the positive, to get the results which are as positive as possible. And I'm afraid that after after this, like if people are ready to um, to 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 lie to themselves in order to get the results that they want, it seems that they are very likely to lie to themselves when they will make decisions about what what uh, 
what uh, welfare programs are to be implemented in the future, right? Um, <laughs> what are your, I mean, yeah. before yeah. before we go to, to the, the philosophical aspects, the ethical aspects of the UBI, what, you, you've been working with governments, right? Uh, yes. Do you think people are likely to take truth seriously when they are making the decisions that are... <laughs> political no uh, look but you know most of these so-called you know experiments or pilot schemes or whatever you like to call them it doesn't matter what it is whether it's welfare or education or healthcare or you know you name housing um it doesn't matter what it is it's usually um a government an authority that ha that wants to do a certain thing but feels that it can't do that right now because public opinion is against it. So they say, well, we'll have an experiment and we'll see whether it works. And then you design the experiment so that um, hopefully it will work. And then you say, right, well, we should be doing more of that now. The, but the results were so good. Um, so uh, it's fraudulent from that. It's it's a political thing. It's, it's fraudulent from, from that point of view. You need to get something which is designed by independent people. But even then, I think there are problems with any kind of experiment, because um, if you've got uh, experiments in political programs which are limited in, um, in their application, their geographical application, well, there are other, in other incentives at work there that people can go to other, other locations, for example. If it's limited in time, I mean, an experiment has to be limited somehow. So you, you I say, right, well, it's for th this particular group of people, it's this, this particular piece of land, it's it's uh, only going to work for five years, and then we'll, we'll assess the results. That, that's what an experiment is. But in so many cases, um, you you can't get the full results just by a uh, an experiment. I mean, for example, take a completely different case, education vouchers. Education vouchers is a good idea. You give parents an amount of money, which is roughly equal to what the government's spending on their education now. And you say, well, you can spend that in any school you like. And if you want to top it up from your own income, off you go. And, you know, we've, we've tried having experiments with that. But, you know, who is going to build a new school to capture that money if it's only for a five year experiment? Nobody's going to do that. So uh, these sorts of problems um, uh, uh, abound in any any kind of pilot or, or experiment. And as I say, um, you know, most of them are designed by the government of the day, which just wants to do something, but uh, feels that it's got to get a little bit of evidence in to do it. So and, and again, as you're you're correct, I mean, the, the United States is a very strange country and they have a welfare system which is much different from ours in, in Europe. Uh, and so you will get different effects. And, and depending on how you design the scheme, you will get different effects again. So it's very difficult to extrapolate from one case to another anyway. Right. And depending on what you measure. And uh, and also the, the problem with the UBI experiments is obviously that if somebody gets uh, some money every month for two years and nobody else gets it. So you've won lottery, right? <laughs> um, so obviously it has it has some effect on your mental well-being, let's say. And and uh, and also if, if you know this is just gonna be for two years and after that you're not gonna get any money the yeah. same way. Um, and you... you're not gonna drop out of the labor market, right? Yeah. Um now I think we can exactly yes, exactly. Yeah. And and you know, I think you know, so many uh cases of political programs. You only know their full effects 30, 40, 50 years later. Um, you know, as, as I say, um, you know, I think that young people would face the highest disincentive because they're not used to having all this cash. And so they would drop out. But it, it's going to be 20, 30 years before you actually really notice the effects of that. Uh, or look at the current welfare system, which, um, you know, I was in the UK, uh, brought in uh, just after the Second World War, about 1948. And now we have families where you've got three generations who've never worked. They've always lived on welfare benefits, one sort or another. Now, the cultural effect of that is huge, but it takes you 30 years at least to see it. <laughs> 
and uh, and by then it's too late you know you can't just rip it up and say well you're not having welfare anymore <laughs> you know because you've got so many people who are dependent on it who will fight tooth and nail to make sure that it carries on so so that's really the problems of of short term experiments it's it's the long term uh problem of incentives that's 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 the worry okay um Yes, thank you for this. Um, so I think we can now go to the philosophical, ethical aspects of, of the UBI issue. And I, I, I just thought of, um, of something that I saw on social media. It was something like, um, somebody is saying that this idea that you have to earn a living is actually scary and unethical. And how can you make somebody like how can you make somebody's living being dependent on something like labor market or, or having a job or um so and of course on the other side there is this reciprocity question right because uh, if you have we if let's say we implement the ubi and we find a way of financing it uh, as you've mentioned there is going to be uh, some people who are going to be just the recipients and others who are going to contribute a lot to to those others being able to receive uh, the money from government so okay so yeah. So, what are your thoughts on the 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 ethical aspects? Well, um, you know, I, I I think look, I think life in general is scary, <laughs> right. and uh, it's particularly scary to young people of the sort who appear a lot on social media. Obviously, um, you know, they're just entering the the workforce, um, and you know, you can see the problems that young people they enter the workforce, um, they don't have any human capital. In other words, they haven't built up. Uh, skills. Um, they haven't built up the skills of work. Uh, they haven't built up, up the habits of work, like getting out of bed in the morning and you know setting the alarm and uh, going to work and uh, putting in a, a full day. They they uh, they don't have those habits and being able to work with other people in in an office or wherever it is. And they don't have those uh, skills. And those skills take a long time to to build up and you know some you can build up in five years, 10 years. Uh, other things like business connections and so on uh, take decades to, to build up. So um, it is scary when, when you're setting out and it's very scary when you're starting a new business. That is true. And, and it is, and, and what you, uh, again, I found this in my, my book in, uh, on entrepreneurship. What you want is a culture where people can fail and dust themselves off and start again. And, and nobody holds it against them that they've failed. And that's, that's not true in some cultures. It's very true in the United States. Uh, they don't mind if somebody has gone bust. I mean, um, uh, Jeff Bezos, for example, um, he had many business failures before he got Amazon right. And, you know, he thought Amazon was going to be a sort of financial, uh, uh, advising house and then he thought it was going to be a bookshop and, and now it's everything um so it, it took him a long long time and he had many failures and nobody held the failures against him uh, and he you learn from your failures so yeah life is scary but you've got to learn from your mistakes and then you can move on and one of the philosophical problems i have uh with uh um, UBI in particular, but with many other welfare systems, is that um, they they don't allow you to fail. You, you don't have to fail. And so if you don't fail, you can just live on the basic income. Uh, you're not trying, you're, there's no incentive for you to try something new and fail at it, really. Um, yes, you know you're, you're not going to be living in destitution, but even so, why bother? Um, and, and people aren't making uh, choices or they're making bad choices and they know that even if it's a bad choice, I can, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still OK. I can still, I can still um, live comfortably and so on. Um, so people don't make bad choices. <laughs> they don't learn from their bad choices. And then that means there's no learning that we don't adapt as human beings and that we don't 
innovate as much as human beings. Uh, we don't learn from our mistakes. And that actually reduces human progress. So the more you wrap people in cotton wool, uh, the, the less progress you're going to have because nobody's going to make choices that they really feel the, the result of. The, you know, they're, they're always looked after whether it's a good choice or a bad choice. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask about, yes, this purely philosophical aspect, let's say, of, 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 of the UBI and how, let's say, people on the side that we are both on, who, who, who are skeptical of the idea, what kind of arguments we make, because, um, because well, all the arguments that say that something is is to be done or something is not to be done. They are they are ethical in some mm, hmm. in some way or another, right? Hmm. And uh, because some of the arguments that we at the Lithuanian Free Market Institute make, they are sort of um, Aristotelian in a way that they are connected with an idea that there is some sort of human excellence or flourishing, and those two are interconnected. And the, the problem with UBI is, is something that you just said, is that it's going to make people not as good as people. Does that make sense in English? I, I, I'm not sure. It's my yes. second language. But, <clears throat> but the, 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 there will be less space for human excellence and therefore for human flourishing. And then there are other kinds of arguments that are more about, more concerned, that, that are not concerned with, uh, with, the flourishing aspect, but more, are more concerned with like individual rights aspect, and the individual rights aspect is something that like the, the reciprocity question, right? So that how can you ask some people to make such such large contributions to to the well being of other people who don't have to make any effort at all to get them? Um, yeah. What would be your reflection of, of what arguments should be made? Or are, are those two sides that can supplement one another? Well, um, I, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think I think uh, human beings have a very profound sense of justice, and uh, they don't like uh, when uh, people can coast along without contributing to society or contributing to other people. Um, and they feel that that is unjust. So I, I, I mean, I think this is one of the the arguments against most uh, welfare <coughs> systems is that uh, most people think that they're fine up to a point. You know, we don't want people um, destitute um, on on the on the street, um, but at the same time, uh, we shouldn't be making life too comfortable because then uh, we'll, you'll have that disincentive and pe people will not feel that they have to contribute to the society and contribute to other people and do something useful. And so uh, many people would think that the the, the higher this uh, benefit goes, and as I say, it will carry on getting bid up um, in value, uh, that the more injustice, in, injustice you, you are putting on, on society. And, uh, you know, we normally, our normal idea of justice is that we um, we treat people on the basis of merit and we want to reward people on the basis of merit and indeed, you know, punish people on the, on the basis of demerit so that people do more of the things which are merit worthy and uh, more, uh, fewer of the things that are not uh, merit worthy. So um, you, you've got a real, I think, problem with uh, in, in the justice uh, uh, aspect of of this idea. And I also think that, um, again, work, um, in it, it brings a certain a sense of responsibility, uh, which you wouldn't get if you're just simply being paid by the government. Um, and it brings a sense of achievement. And you think if you're paying people not to work, or you pay people who, who don't work, and you're reducing the incentive on them to work, then they don't get that sense of achievement. That, that, that they are takers. They're not producers. They're not doing anything that's useful to other people. I, I mean, most people I know in in business, they can be multimillionaires, 
but they do it because they love what they're doing. They love producing products and see lots of people wanting to buy them. That's what really thrills them, not necessarily the money. And, uh, and, and that's the achievement you get from work and, the, and you get the interaction with your colleagues and so on. And I worry that anything that's going to trap people um, out in, in an out of work condition, uh, you're going to lose um, all, all of that. I, I think, you know, the, uh, there's another philosophical aspect to this, which is that um, it sees uh, money as being the only value, that all we value is money. Now, most people that I know who are in the charitable sector or the think tank sector, it's all very well paid. They're not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they want to change society or they want to help other people. And this is a very powerful human motive. And I think that just by giving everybody cash, you'd be focusing everybody on money and, and you'd be forgetting that they are a whole bunch, those individuals, there are a whole bunch of other values which you ought to be encouraging. And this doesn't encourage them. So I think there are deep philosophical problems as well as political ones and as well as economic ones. Okay, so thank you very much for being with being with me today for the record and um, for all for all of our listeners and watchers. This has been the the Lithuanian Free Market Institute post podcast on the UBI. Uh, my guest today has been Eamon Butler. For more podcasts uh, and talks on the UBI, you can check our channel. Most of the content there is in Lithuanian, but we we are producing some content in English as well. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay. Right. So thank you. I'm I'm never sure of how good is my English. So no, it's, um, it's mine. It's absolutely fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. a, it's a terrible language because it's, you know, the words come from so many different roots mm. and they have oh. sort of nuances of meaning and oh I don't, know, I don't know why anybody wants to speak English <laughs> well you have to nowadays but then you know my mother tongue is Lithuanian and there are around three and a half million Lithuanian speakers around the world so if I didn't speak oh, right. a foreign language my world would be very, very small. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> so, very good. Okay, thank you very much for this. No, <clears throat> you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, carry on the good work. Yes. So, um, I'm going to write you when we release the podcast. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if this is going to be soon because now it's the summer, right? Yeah, and it's it's uh -huh. pointless to release stuff in August because nobody yeah. listens to stuff in yeah. August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 People no, no, want no, to no, go to beaches and. How is your foot? Sorry, oh How my is... foot. Um, it, it's better, but it's good that I do not have to walk on the podcast because if I had to, <laughs> everybody would see that I'm not okay. Oh well, I hope it gets better soon. Yes. Yeah, I ho hopefully, hopefully. Mm. Right, but it's not broken, right. so it's good. Okay, yeah, good. <clears throat> so, All righty. Thank you very much. Um, again, so. oh, we we may have some other ideas for what. Yeah, topic. sure. Anytime, anytime. Yeah. On, yeah. on on the topic. So happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So goodbye. All right. Cheerio.